you know, as we have navigated over the last five, six months uh, during COVID and all these things, you know, I, I know there's this great anticipation to get back to normal or, or some normalcy. But, you know, what I've been processing with our team and what the Lord has been dealing with me on is I, I really don't want to, I, I do want normalcy, don't get me wrong, but, but I also don't want to miss what God is doing in this season. I, I don't want to miss what God is doing in, and wants to do in my life. I don't want to miss what God wants to do in the church. Like I was thinking, uh, before we went into this pandemic, 70% of young people were walking away from the church in America. And so you just think like, man, we had some things right, but we, we had some things wrong. And just wanted to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what, what is it going to look like in this next season of life? And I, I'm just worried that sometimes if we're, we got this, we're so anxious for normalcy that we might miss the moment. And so I, I want to talk to you a little bit today ab- around this idea of tension and tendons. Tension and tendons. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for your presence in this place. Lord, I thank you that you've given us the gift of technology. But Lord, we're not glued to it. We don't need it. We're grateful for it. Grateful for when it works. But Lord, ultimately, God, we need to experience you today. We need an encounter today. Lord, some, some eyes need to be opened. Lord, some hearts need to be healed. Some lives need to be restored. There's some redemption that needs to take place here today. So Holy Spirit, would you come and use me as a vessel for your glory that we might see you and only you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen, amen, and amen. Well, I, I want to take you, I want to take you back again. I, I don't know why I've been in the, the World War II era, but that's just where I've been. I, I love history. And, and I want to take you back to, to pre-World War II. Hitler's kind of building his army. He is, you know, has his propaganda, is, is kind of at an all-time high. He's building a military. And, and there's this, this man, he's a theologian. He was running a seminary. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? And, uh, and he was in Germany at the time. And one of his friends came to visit him at the, cemetery, uh, at the, cemetery, at the seminary. Hopefully our seminaries are not cemeteries. Uh, some of them might be, though. Uh, but his friend came to visit him at the seminary. And he noticed that, that Dietrich was a little intense. Uh, like he, his friend was almost like, man, you're being a little bit too spiritual. Like, you're taking this a little bit too far. You're a little excited. Why don't you settle down? Lay off the students a little bit. Like, what, what's the urgency? What's the intensity for? So he said, I want to take you on a little trip. Let's take a ride. So their ride, they jumped in a canoe, and they rowed across the river, and they found themselves on a bank. And across the bank was a, a portion of Hitler's army basically their boot camp that was in preparation. And Dietrich looked at his buddy and he said, listen, he said, you see what Hitler is preparing there? He said, what we are doing in the seminary has to be far greater than what they're doing in this training camp. And I just thought, you know, perspective is huge. How how we see things, it it really matters, doesn't it? I mean, I, I don't think that it played out the way that Dietrich thought it was going to play out because what ended up happening, the seminary closed. A lot of his guys that were in the seminary studying the Bible went and joined Hitler's army. And I'm sure that he looked like at the end of the day, like when you look at who won, it looked like maybe Dietrich's plan and intensity and urgency just kind of fell by the wayside. But now today, Hitler is gone and Dietrich's writings and work still are impacting millions and they have impacted millions over the centuries. So it didn't work the way that he thought, but the victory still was his. But, but I, I think it's, it's important for us, if we have an improper perspective, it can cost us. I've told you countless times that when the economy crashed in 08, we could have bought a condo in Dublin for 90000 I still need therapy for this. This is part of it. So thank you for letting me tell you this at least once or twice a year. For 90000 but I wasn't able to see. I was scared. Or I thought, hey, it's going to go down a little bit more. But somebody saw something that I didn't see. And they bought that one, and they probably bought another one, and another one, and now they're selling for three, four times that amount. But, but a lack of perspective or a lack of understanding, it, it can cost you. It can cost you relationally, can't it? 
Sometimes I, I meet with couples and I see that in relationships we tend to, uh, if we're not careful, maximize on the small things and miss the big picture. Like sometimes it's the smallest things that create the biggest arguments because we're missing the big picture. I, I, think, I think it can cost us in a way where, you know, today people are, they're using stocks, they're using uh, different ways to make money. Some people are totally afraid. Many people are making millions of dollars in the stock market right now, but then people are afraid of a recession. It just depends on your perspective. And then I think spiritually we get mixed up as well. That spiritually, if we're not careful, we can get so focused on temporary things that it keeps us from seeing what's eternal, and then our priorities get diluted, and we start to make really minor things major, or we major in the minors, are you with me, and, and lose sight of this beautiful picture of eternity. That's why in this season, if you guys catch this theme, I've been trying to get your eyes off of the temporary, because that's where, it's, where we're tempted, that's where you and I are tempted to, to allow that to consume us, and I want to get our eyes on to the eternal. If we have the wrong perspective, it can cause us to judge others, it can cause us to fight with one another in a way that causes division, that causes difficulty, that causes fractions. For example, King David. King David slept with a man's wife, had him killed on the front lines of battle, and then tried to cover it up. And when the prophet Nathan came to King David and said, hey, hey, Dave, let me tell you a story. And I'm going to paraphrase the story. Basically, he said there was this one guy who had this, this little lamb, and it was the only lamb that he had, but this one guy who had, like, you know, super rich and wealthy came and took the only lamb from this guy. And David was like, that man should die. And Nathan was like, let me put things in perspective. That man is you. It's like, ah. Oh. And so sometimes when we, we lack perspective, it, it can cause fights. Sometimes we miss even uh, uh, the small things. So let me, let me say it this way. Sometimes we don't major on the minor. Sometimes we forget about the minors because we're so focused on the major. <laughs> Are you with me? So I, I think sometimes we can be so focused on a destination that we miss the building blocks. Like, like we want to take a city. We want to see a region come to Jesus. We want revival but then we miss the barista. We miss the one person that God has put in front of us every single day. We miss our family, right? And so, so I wanna make sure that we're, we're going in to this season or we're, we're headed into this next phase, these 21 days of prayer and fasting with, with the proper perspective. You know, when I was growing up, there were times that I would go and I would open up the refrigerator door and I would just sit there for minutes. Then I'd open up the freezer. And then if it was a hot day like this, I'd just sit there for a minute. And I remember my mom would come and say, shut the door. The food's going to spoil. You're wasting the PG&E. And in my mind, I'm just like, mom, I'm just trying to get something to eat. It's taking me a little bit longer to figure that out. Perspective. See, see perspective will have an impact on our understanding. And if you're taking notes, you might want to jot this down. And our understanding will determine our urgency. Our perspective will have an impact on our understanding and our understanding will determine our urgency. Now, I think a lot of times we get a distorted perspective of things for many different reasons. Like it, it could be sin in our life that, that's clouding our vision and our judgment. It could be our pride. It could be a lack of experience. It could be a lack of knowledge. It could be um, so many different things. Like we could be blinded by the enemy. We could lack discernment. So many of these different elements that all really correlate to impact one area of our life, which is our thinking. There's a lot of different things that can distort our perspective, but when our perspective is distorted, our thinking is gonna be distorted. And if our thinking gets distorted, our understanding is gonna get distorted. And if our understanding is distorted, uh, our urgency and how we move and the intensity of our life or what we focus on can be completely distorted. You know, one of my favorite passages of scripture is found in 2 Kings chapter six. It's a story about Elisha and Elisha's just, just, he's a prophet that just kind of has that, that subtle confidence that nothing moves him, right? There's moments where he's had, he had some, some difficulty and, and wrestled with some bouts of, of maybe even depression and loneliness. There was some spiritual warfare happening in his life. But there was also a lot of moments where there was just a confidence. 
I remember the story where uh, the king of Aram wanted to, to wipe them out and his servant got up one morning and he looked out and they were surrounded by chariots. And, and the servant was like, hey, Elijah, like, basically, we're in trouble, man. Look, look at this army. And it was with a, a subtle confidence as he looks at his servant and he says this. He says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The funny thing is the servant just couldn't see that. So like, like the advantage is theirs, but his limited perspective was affecting his understanding. And when our understanding is affected, we can dive into fear and we can dive into worry. And, and it says, so Elisha prayed. Everybody say prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, see, if, if we're not able to see the big picture, that can cost us not only all of these other things that I talked about, but it can also cost us our peace. We can find ourselves looking at something, but th with the wrong perspective, with the wrong understanding, we don't have eyes to see what's really going on, and it can cost us our peace. We can tend to worry. And so this, wor this, this servant goes from worry to peace in a moment's time, and the key was prayer. The key was prayer. Lord, would you open his eyes? And in a moment's time, his perspective was totally changed, and he had peace, and he could see the bigger picture. Come on, church, listen. I, the days that we're living in, we cannot afford to not see the bigger picture. We're living in time where we need eyes to see. We need ears to hear. But I'm wondering, though, if so many of us, if there's not that person beside us that says, hey, let's pray, Lord, that you would open up his eyes. I wonder if, if, if there's people around us, and, and even we may be one of those people that we're constantly looking at things, but we're missing the bigger picture. We can't see God. We can't see the possibilities. We can't see the opportunity. We can't see what's happening in the spirit. And so we're paralyzed in the natural with, we, with worry, with fear, with timidity. And God is like, oh, I want to open up your eyes because I don't want you to miss this moment. And we head back into Philippians chapter 4. This is where we were last week. We're going to kind of wrap up this part of the text. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We talked about that last week. If you missed it, you can go on everywhere, podcast, YouTube, everywhere. It's everywhere. He says, let your reasonableness be made known to everybody, for the Lord is at hand. Now, we talked about how the Lord is at hand means that the Lord is not just simply at hand um, in time, but also in space, meaning the Lord is not just coming soon, but the Lord is also near. And nearness has a huge impact. When we, when we realize that God is near, it should dramatically shift our perspective. And so Paul goes on and he says, so don't worry about anything. Everybody say anything. Instead, pray about everything. So you mean like anything, God? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And then he says this, tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. It's a supernatural peace. What we need right now, ladies and gentlemen, is a supernatural peace as we navigate these waters, not as peace as the world gives, but only the peace that God can give, which will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul was basically saying, hey, there could be a couple of patterns in your life. There can be a pattern of worry or there can be a pattern of prayer. One is going to lead to peace. The other is going to lead to anxiety. And so it's almost as if Paul is saying, let this become a rhythm. Let this become a pattern. Can I just tell you, if you're praying about everything, that is a rhythm. That becomes a pattern. And, and, and it's, it's, it's pray about everything. Like, I don't want you to worry about anything. Instead, I want you to pray about everything. Not just emergencies, but I want you to pray about everything. And Paul is, is speaking uh, of this type of prayer. He's not so much dealing with the theology of prayer, but the priority of it in our lives. And, and he says this, he says, I want you to, to tell God what you need, and then I want you to thank him, meaning I, I want you to walk so close, so deeply, so confident in your relationship with God 
that the end result of your time of prayer just explodes with thanksgiving because there's such a confidence, there's such a closeness, just like Elijah saying, the Lord, open up his eyes. Just such an assurance, God, that you are going to answer. And I think this is special because prayer reminds us a couple of things as we look at it in, in that context. Prayer reminds us that we're not alone. I think sometimes we forget that prayer is not just a, a task that we do, but rather a relationship that we're growing in. And I think it's so special because prayer, it, it just, it reminds us that we're not alone. Like in our marriage struggle, in, in our singleness, it reminds us that you're not by yourself. That as I'm talking to God, I have this, this privilege of coming to talk and conversate and bring my requests, bring my worship. I have this intimacy opportunity with God and it just reminds us that we're not alone. When we're trying to figure things out, we're not alone. Some of us, man, we, we, we could be in a room full of people and we still feel alone. Some of you guys right here, you're in a, a crowd of people, but there's still a sense of loneliness. Some of you guys are online. You're in the midst of your family. Everybody's there, but you still feel alone. And prayer is this, this, this reminder that the God of the universe is present with you. I mean, that's, that's just, let that sink in for a moment. And it just doesn't remind us that we're not alone, but prayer actually changes us in the process. God begins to shift our perspective. God didn't change the situation for Elijah's servant. He just opened his eyes to see it a lot differently. And so, so prayer does something on the inside of us. It's so powerful. And Paul says, listen, I want you, I, I want you to bring your request, but, but let it be with thanksgiving. You know, gratitude is so powerful. Gratitude has the potential for you and I to be grateful. You have to remember altars. So it's like, as I'm praying for this, I'm reminded of what you've done here. As I'm praying for this, I'm reminded of the altars and your faithfulness throughout all of my days. As I'm praying right now, God, I'm also reminded, uh, I can also be grateful in the moment, just in the present. God, I, I have breath in my lungs. I'm walking with you. Salvation is mine. I mean, there's so many things that you and I have an opportunity to be grateful for. But Paul said that's only going to come with intimacy. That's only going to come when there is this pattern of prayer that's building such an intimacy that results in thanksgiving. And just, I'm, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that'll shift your perspective. It'll shift your perspective so much. Jesus said this, watch and pray. When Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is, is in this intense moment, getting ready to face the cross. The disciples are falling asleep. And Jesus says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Like, like prayer has, it, it's so powerful that, that it, it shifts our perspective to the point that it helps us to see. It helps us to get our eyes on the Lord. It helps us to discern. It helps us to see what's really happening. It helps us to grab the big picture. And it gives us such a perspective that can keep us from darkness, from deception, keep us close to the light so we're not stumbling all over ourselves. In the midst of a critical hour the disciples are sleeping i'm just telling you church that just can't be us and jesus's instructions to them was watch and pray because this is what prayer does prayer helps us see in the spirit what we might miss in the flesh prayer helps us to see in the spirit what we might miss in the flesh i'm just gonna let that sink in for a moment what are you missing in the spirit right now that is costing you a lot? Because that's what prayer does. Prayer helps us to see in the spirit what we might miss in the flesh. So I guess it begs to ask the question, why don't we pray a lot? I, I mean, especially as followers, of believers, uh, as followers of Jesus. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus or you're tuning in online, we're so grateful that you're with us today. But I do have a question just for those of you guys that are following Jesus. If we know that this is so important, why don't we pray? Like we know, I, I've had countless conversations with people and it goes something like this. Hey man, how, how's your relationship with God going? How's your daily time with him? How's your intimacy with Jesus? That's a great question. That always gets a little bit deeper. You know, hey, how's your relationship with God? Oh, it's going good, could be better. It's like everybody's answer, right? Oh, I could be doing a little bit more, and a lot of times how people answer that question, it really helps me to know if they understand the gospel or not. 
But, but I, I think it's, it's interesting. A lot of times it's like, oh, man, I just wish I had a little bit more time. Like, how's your prayer life? Oh, well, you know, everybody, almost 90% could be better. And what they're saying is, I know that prayer is vitally important, but for some reason I just don't do it. I mean, like right now, 16% of 18 to 29-year-olds said that they pray every day. 16%. 34% of people said that they pray every day between the ages of 30 and 49. 29% of people that say they pray every day is between 50 and 64, ages 50 and 64, only 29% of them pray. And then 65 and older, 21% of them say that I pray every single day. Meaning there's really not a percentage over 34% of people that say, man, this is, ah, man, this is a daily necessity. And so what that tells me is this, is that prayer helps us to see in the spirit well, we might miss in the flesh. And if our prayer life is super diminished, we're probably missing a whole lot. And I don't want you to miss your moment. I don't want you to miss what God wants to do in your life and through your life in this season. And so I, I think to answer the question, though, why don't we pray? That, that's a greater question, right? And I, I think it's because of this word tension. There's just tension in prayer. Let me tell you about, talk to you about tension. So I was at the skate park with my kiddos this last week. Almost broke my wrist yesterday. It was horrible. I should not be riding scooters at 40 years old. I, 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 I miss, I miss, I like jumped too far into like this, you know, the, the big swimming pool bowl and I just went head first and I didn't want to hit my face. So I put my arm out. Just ridiculous. What am I doing out there? And so, so we were at the skate park the previous day and, and my, my daughters, you know, they're having fun and it was crazy. And some of these skateboarders, man, they're just flying through just, and the little kids get in the way and they're like, man, what's up? Get out of my way. So one of them did it to my daughter man, I'm like, we're going to outreach at a different skate park because I'm about to check these kids, right? <laughs> and so, so I, let, I went up to the kids and I was heated because at that time she, she, she didn't want to skate anymore. And I'm like, I want my daughter to love this place. So I went over to the kids and said, hey, hey guys, which one of you yelled at my daughter? None of us. None of us did. Like pastor, right? <laughs> I thought you were a pastor. <laughs> I was like, make sure I didn't know any of them or their parents. Don't know any of you. None of them, right? So I just, I just couldn't let it go, but I, I, I'm here to serve these kids, right? I, this, I'm called to this region, not just the city. This is in Dublin, so that counts. And, uh, and so, so we have some extra pizzas, and I, I go over and say, hey, guys, I know it's COVID, but I got pizza. Cool thing about teenagers, they don't care about COVID. They're, well, it's not cool, but you guys know what I'm saying. They're like, the pizza's not going to waste. And so, so they're like, hey, man, we'll take the pizza. I said, so my, my daughter identified you, and I pointed to one of the young masters that you, you, were the, you were the guy. That wasn't even the tension. All that's easy for me to navigate. The tension came when he said, no, nah, man, I mean, sir, I didn't do it. And I'm like, sir? I'm like, 40 years old, my youngness is gone. He correct. He looks at me, he's like, oh, you're not a man, you're a sir. You're, you're older. That's where the most tension came that day. I walked away like, gosh, I'm a sir now, right? But it was cool. We gave him pizza and we talked and kissed and made up and it was, it was awesome. But, but the, I think a lot of times we don't pray because there's tension. Many times we want clarity, but God says, you may need a little tension. You may need just a little bit of tension. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, you mean I can ask anything, God? Like, I just, I want to eat cookie dough every day and not have to worry about calories. Anything. Now, here's the tension. According to his will. Ah, uh, tension. Right? And then he says, but this is the beautiful thing. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Everybody say amen. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have whatever we ask him. Right? So, so this is the tension that we pray, and God hears us, and he answers. Like, that should be awesome. But it also leaves us in tension because I think sometimes there's this tension of God is answering, but we don't want to hear what he has to say. Like, hey, man, uh, is, is, is God been speaking to you? No, man, he's not been speaking. You know, I'm really frustrated with my spouse. He's not changing her. I'm like, man, have you been praying? I've been praying. But God's like, yeah, uh, how about we start with your attitude? I ain't trying to hear that. Right, like, man, I just, I just hate my boss, my, just hate my job, and 
God's like, well, all right, I, I get it, yeah? It's a little bit rough, but how about we start with your laziness? So like, God ain't speaking. I don't hear him. Come on, God, like, like, like God, I, I, I'm single. I want I to be wifed up, Lord. I, I can't do this anymore, right? And God's like, yeah, you want a godly wife. Let's work on your godliness. Or, or how about, man, I'm struggling. I got no peace inside, and I just, you know, I'm just frustrated with God. And yeah, and God's saying, hey, how about we start with the sin? Let's start there. No. And what about finances? God's like, yeah, let's start with your Amazon account. That'd be a great start. Let's start with Prime, right? So a lot of times God answers. God is answering, but we don't want to listen. When Jonah didn't want to listen, this is the detriment of this. I, and, I, and I'm kind of making light and we're having fun, but this is true. And because of this, many of us have distanced ourselves from prayer. Just like Jonah, when God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, Jonah's like, no, you don't. I'm not going there. Matter of fact, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. What did Jonah avoid like the plague? It was prayer. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to hear from you. I just want to sleep and go to Tarshish. Right? I, just, I just want to get out of here. And so, so prayer, listen, when, when we have this tension in our life, it can actually distance us from God because we're not going to hear what God has to say, the second tension is this, is that um, God answers, but he answers differently than we hoped. And we talked about this earlier in this series where, man, I prayed for this person to get healed, and I watched God heal this person, but then I watched this person die. I pray the same prayer. I, I mean, I pray with all the faith I got, and we see one person get set free and delivered, and the other is still struggling. And so, so it, can be, it can be tough. Like, uh, like I've told you, I've prayed for grown men that have been irresponsible with their life and God has done an in instantaneous miracle. And then we've prayed for infants, innocent kids, and I've watched them pass away. And I, there's a mystery to that. I, I don't know why, but I know this, is that that little baby is still healed as now that child is with the Lord, but it wasn't in the way that I hoped. And th this can be devastating, right? I, I don't think Bonhoeffer was... was thinking, hey, my college is going to be destroyed. Some of my students are going to join Hitler. Everything's going to be tore up. I'm going to die a martyr. I don't know if he was hoping for that and that his greater influence would be after his life, not during it. It's a, it's, it's a tension. It's a tension that you and I face. I, I, I think with this one, I love what Tim Keller says. Tim Keller says it this way. God is so good that he will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything that he knew. Isn't that a great picture that God is so good that he's like, I see a much greater perspective and I know you really want that, but that is not gonna be, what you would really want is this if you knew what I knew. And so I'm gonna respond that way, but because it's not the way that we hope for, it's frustrating and it's tough. There's tension. Third one is this, is that, God's delays, God delays his answer to draw us closer in relationship to him. Uh, many of you guys know that, man, the first three years of my walk with Jesus, I battled with severe anxiety, thought I was losing my mind, did not know what was happening in this time of darkness. I don't believe God caused it. I believe God allowed me to go through the season. But can I tell you, I pressed into him like I never have at any other time in my life. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm not there anymore. But the intimacy and the relationship that came from that dark season, I would never take back. I would never go back and say, God, I didn't want you to do that over. It was painful. It was dark. It was, it was tough. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the relationship and the intimacy that came from that was incredible. All right, let, let, let me take you back to, to Naaman, 2 Kings chapter 5. There's a man by the name of Naaman. He was uh, a commander of the king of Aram's army. And, <clears throat> and this guy... He was, he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And so he hears that there's a prophet in Israel and in, in Samaria, which is Elisha. And, and so he gets permission. Long story short, he goes to the prophet. And he brings all of his goods and his whole entourage. And he just brings all of his, you know, tons of wealth to say, hey, man, I'm here. Go ahead and do your little thing so I can get this leprosy healed and get back to, to my job. And so he shows up, and Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He sends his messenger out. And he says, go 
dunked yourself in the Jordan River seven times. God's going to heal you, and it'll be good. And so, so he, he's, he's upset. He's like, you don't even come out to greet me. Do you know who I am? Like, I thought for sure you were going to come and wave your little hand, you know, do your little prayer thing over my wounded skin, and that, you know, this big, ma magnificent miracle would happen. I'd pay you a couple, you know, some gold and silver, and I'd be back on my way. And, and I love what happens in this process. He gets so mad. He said, aren't the rivers in Damascus greater than the Jordan? Still not seen. Perspective still skewed. But his servant comes to him and he says, listen, if, if he would ask you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? So basically, why don't you shut your mouth and just do it? And so he does. And he dunks himself seven times in this process that God had called him to. Seven times in the river. And he comes out and he's healed. And I love his response. His response is this. The Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, this is it. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. Can I just tell you that sometimes God's delay, I know it creates a little tension, but he's trying to help you get a revelation of him. He's trying to draw you in in such a way where it's far bigger than your results. He wants you walking away with a deeper relationship with him. And I know that preaches well, but it creates tension. I think we have to realize that prayer is not a button to be pressed, but a person to be pursued. I think so many times we turn prayer into a process, to a task, and we forgot about person. We forgot about the person of Christ. We, for, we forget about the intimacy. We so want the result. It's like, it's like being so consumed with all the tasks at your wedding that you miss the intimacy that actually gives birth to new life. I'm just telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that God wants intimacy with us. Intimacy with God dramatically shifts your perspective and your understanding and God knows what we need. I, I love this passage in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, most of the time we read this, you know, it's a love chapter. We read this at weddings, but it's not about weddings. It's about a divided church and the Lord saying, this is how you should love and serve one another. And Paul goes on after he says, you know, love is patient, love is kind and all those good things. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only, only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I, know, now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. That is a little complex, but what Paul is saying is this. As many times maturity is marked by your ability to deal with the mystery, to deal with the tension when you can't figure it out. Let me say that again. A mark of maturity, of spiritual maturity, is that you can deal with the mystery of not having everything figured out or not understanding why God is doing this and why he's not doing that because you're so confident in his character. You're so rooted in who he is that if you're not, the mystery will discourage you. The mystery can push you away. And God's not trying to play hide and go seek. It's just he's seeing things from a whole different light. Are you with me? And so I'm just saying the mystery isn't always bad. Like there's some things that Paul's saying we're going to know now, some things we're not going to know till later. I'm good with that because I know in whom I've served. And so the last one is this. Are you, are you tracking? The last one is this. So we got some tension, but we also need tendons. Tendons. Now, if you guys don't know what a tendon is, a tendon is this, this tissue that connects the muscle to the bone so that the muscle can contract. As the muscle contracts, the tendon keeps us anchored to the bone. Are you, are you with me? Keeps the muscle anchored to the bone. And so I just wanna to talk to you about one tendon as we close. And I'm gonna make this very quick because we're gonna talk about it more next week, but I wanna plant this seed in your heart. Is, is that, listen, prayer many times is ineffective in our life. Is because the muscle of prayer doesn't have the tendons around it to keep it anchored and connected. Tenants like scripture, Bible study and meditation. Tenants like solitude. And tenants like what I want to just talk for briefly about is fasting. A lot of times, listen, when, when, when prayer is kind of left on its own, man, it, it can be a struggle 
But when you partner prayer with fasting, scripture reading, solitude, meditating on God's word, all of a sudden it sticks in a way, it connects us in a way that we might not otherwise experience. And so l- let, me, let, me say, let me say it this way, is that fasting and prayer disconnects us from the things of the world and connects us to the things of God. Fasting disconnects from the things of the world Right, we're, we're fasting something. We're, we're fasting food, and how many of you guys know we depend on food so much? Third day of fasting is the worst. And we just depend on it, and, and we start to realize our dependency on food, but we, we fast food a little bit, and what, what ends up happening is, is, is we start to see our, our dependency on God. Our, our flesh gets a little bit weak. It, we, we find ourselves disconnecting from the things of the world. And then what does prayer do? Prayer connects us to the things of God. And so, so maybe it's a fast of food, maybe it's, maybe it's a meal, maybe you're going to go on a long extended fast of food. I, I, I always recommend that you consult your doctor before you do that. Uh, social media would be a great fast in this season. See, fasting is just taking time that you would normally be consumed with this, which you've been dependent on. I'm going to set that aside, and I'm going to take that same time, and I'm going to connect it to prayer. Maybe, maybe it's the news. Maybe you need to take a break from the news for a while. Just disconnect for a minute. Maybe you need to stop listening to that particular music and put on some worship. And over the next 21 days, just kind of disconnect so that you can reconnect in a deeper level of dependence. I, I think a great picture of this is, is Bird Box. Anybody know Bird Box? It's this, this uh, show on Netflix. It's kind of this post-apocalyptic deal, right? And, and how they know that the enemy's coming, we don't even know what the enemy is on, on Bird Box. It could be like extraterrestrial. It could be like demonic. It could be, they just don't tell you. It's weird. And, but, but what it is, is, is what they figured out was if they're blindfolded, you know, the birds kind of let them know when something bad is going to happen or the enemy is coming. And, and so they, they put on blindfolds that, so that their hearing and their, sense, their other senses would be heightened a little bit, right? So if I'm blind, I can't see, but my hearing starts to become a little bit more, the frequency is stronger. And and I I think it's crazy. You know the only part of your body that continues to grow until you die is your ears. Did you know that? Everybody shout out, say, I knew it! Come on. And I love what Jensen Franklin said. He said, listen, he said, if you are walking with Christ and you are not growing in your hearing, something is tragically wrong. Like we should be constantly growing in our hearing and fasting allows us to disconnect, to, 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 to push back some of our senses, that other senses that our spiritual ears might be open in a way that we can hear more clearly. When your body is weak, when you're, you're, you've rejected some of the things of the world for a season to just seek God, something happens in that moment where our spiritual antennas are in tune in a way that normally they weren't. Point in case is this. There was a woman by the name of Anna. She doesn't get much love in the scripture, but super important. Luke chapter two, um, she was a widow. And, and what she did, it says that she lived as a widow to the age of 84 and she never left the temple, but she stayed there day and night worshiping God with fasting and prayer. This was the rhythm of her life. This was the pattern. She came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph. Jesus is as an infant is present. And she began praising God She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. She was one of the first to recognize Christ as the Savior. And can I just tell you this? Apart from prayer, we are limited to see supernatural. We are limited to see spiritually. We are limited to see the possibilities that God wants to do. But when, I'm just telling you, when the Savior was presented, she knew immediately, this is not a son of a carpenter. This is the Savior of the world. So many just saw him as a son, a carpenter. But this woman fasting and prayer just it so connects so close to God that it's like, no, this is the Savior. So this is my prayer. I know it's hot. One more minute. This is my prayer. As I w- I'm praying that God gives you eyes to see over the next 21 days of fasting and prayer. I- I'm praying like Hagar in Genesis chapter 21 Oh, I think this is so good because she was sent out by Abraham with her son Ishmael. Think about this right now. Let let this bear weight on your soul. So hot, she had no water. She's not leaving a service like this going to find water. She's in the middle of the desert. Thirsty, can't even bear to watch her son 
die of thirst. She puts him under a tree and she just goes under and starts weeping like this is it. It's over. And then all of a sudden scripture says, but God opens her eyes to a well. She wasn't blind. There was just some things that she was not able to perceive that God needed to open up her eyes and says, man, I got you on provision. I believe that God is going to open up your eyes to new aspects of provision in a way that you have never experienced before. The second thing I, I want I to, to, to go back to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers uh, chapter 22, uh, there was a man by the name of Balaam. Balaam was headed in a wrong direction. He was, he was pressing up against the will of God. He was going away from the will of God. And God used his donkey, come on somebody, to speak to him. And what happened, it says that God opened his eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord before him. I believe that God wants to bring such a clarity of direction to some. That God wants to open up your eyes during the next 21 days. And then Luke chapter 24 is my last one and I'm done. Luke chapter 24. Disciples are leaving. Jesus has just been crucified and they're discouraged because they think he's dead. And he comes appearing on the road to Emmaus, walking with these disciples, and he doesn't reveal himself yet, but he's talking to them, and they sit down. Finally, they invite Jesus over, but they don't know it's Jesus yet, and they sit down at his table. He breaks bread, and as, they, as Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were open, and they saw the risen Savior. Some of you have been discouraged, and over the next 21 days, the Lord is going to remind you that he is alive, that he is able, that he is faithful, that he is the one who is risen from the dead, that he is the one who is given all power, all authority, and that same spirit that rose him from the dead now lives in us. I believe that God wants to open up your eyes to him in a level of intimacy, in a level of, of, of relationship. That will just be like, oh my goodness. You know what happened at that moment for them? They almost missed their calling. But they got right back up after walking seven miles, and they walked right back to Jerusalem and planted the first church. Can I just tell you, there's some things because of your discouragement you're about to miss. And I'm praying that God is going to open up your eyes so that you don't miss that. So this is what I'm asking of you today is will you just choose your fast and join us in prayer on the next 21 days. Choose your fast. We got everything you need on the website. I know it's hot. You can find all that resources later. We'll email you. Um, but choose your fast. And let's join together in prayer for our nation, for the church. Let's just for one another. And let's see God open eyes in this time that we so desperately need so we don't miss our moment. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for our time together. Listen, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you're listening to my voice online, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer right now. And, I, and, and it's nothing magical about the prayer. It's just a commitment prayer, but I don't wanna leave this moment. If you say, man, I need to surrender my life to God. I need to get right with God today. My perspective of God has been costing me a lot. And I need to get right with the Lord today. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Would you pray this with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, come on. Can we pray this with all of us? Can we just lift our voices with those who really need this moment? Just say, Lord Jesus, today I surrender. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died for me and rose again on the third day. I surrender this moment. I ask that you'd forgive me for my sins, that you'd wash me clean, should make me new. Give me eyes to see. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we give the Lord a big hand?